called but violent like Ben Siegel I'm anti-evil, plus I touch a desert eagle My life's illegal, slaves in prisons are equal The devil's lethal, he killed a hundred million people I'm Dark Man, Ice Man, La Wu-Tang Clan Trapaconti, Sensei, Caprende My Marine Corps, straight from the Trojan War Black Cape Crusader, trap door, flame door Stuck a chain store when I was dirt poor for my reward Next week the Germans had me on the bulletin board I beat that case, they couldn't identify my face I'm triple darkness Silence, I have to erase. Me and my woo pirates start riots with Osiris. Mad, I apply it. Kill you, but I'm quiet. Respect the habit. It's love or law. Shine like a shooting star. Sting with the cobra claw. What? Boom world order. 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 Enter through the cave of your ear In a high-pitched, silent tone Only a door could hear And impregnate you With the wisdom of the world Then your subconscious dreams Come consciously true Have you a such deep thought Your pulse and blood pressure so low You diagnose this corpse Have an out-of-body experience Clear, no interference Everything with physical form Through the appearance Become one with the formless Now you feel your strongest The state travel lies You live for the longest Love a thousand years in a day Without opening your mouth You say everything Thing you wanted to say Attracted to the core of the earth I stay grounded The sun in the center of this I'm surrounded by planets in the mist That spins the wind chill But my light melts your snowflake for 93 mil All who have an ear let them hear as we build Cause one ear of corn can produce a cornfield And one cornfield can produce the corn mill The bread from the body of Christ all is filled With the truth of life inside your bone marrow You can make it physical as large as your shadow Whether space is sight or optic is fiber Become a woo multimedia subscriber And hibernate the woo tape in your mental state Let it meditate, sit back and await the orders For this you don't need no tape recorder So let's prepare for the woo world order Woo world order, woo world order Woo world order, woo world order Woo world order, woo world order, woo world order. We coming soon and we striking at your borders So last week we were talking about this uh, algorithm analysis step-by-step -step process uh, where I gave five uh, basic steps to do this and the first three are the setups, right? Uh, where you want to identify the input, you want to identify the input size, you want to identify an elementary operation and there might be several correct uh, versions of that. Uh, and then the real work kicks in where you have to determine the number of times that an elementary operation executes with respect to the input size. And that means coming up with some sort of a summation. Uh, that means some, uh, you know, maybe a deeper analysis of some sort. Uh, maybe even a, like a 20 page analysis that requires you know, advanced mathematics, but nothing, not, none of that is gonna be in this course. Uh, but what we did not do was step five here, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, asympt asymptotics. Asymptotics is basically big O analysis. Uh, so uh, again, the, step five is to provide a, uh, a classification for that algorithm. That this is a quadratic algorithm, this is a polynomial algorithm, this is a, an exponential algorithm, right? Our motivation here is that we want to characterize an algorithm's performance, per, performance or uh, efficiency with respect to the input size. And we don't want, we want to ignore, we want, we want to basically ignore lower order terms because if I'm looking at a quadratic and I see a constant or a linear term in there, I want to ignore those because I know that the quadratic is going to contribute way more in the long term as n tends towards infinity. 
and we want to ignore constants. Constants, right? Uh, the reason that we want to ignore constants is because of uh, hardware, right? If we upgrade our hardware and it's now twice as fast, there is this uh, hidden uh, uh, constant out front that is now half as big as it was before. Uh, I don't want to be beholden to any particular hardware or say that my algorithm now runs faster because it doesn't. It takes exactly the same number of steps as it did before. It's just that the, the number of steps that you can run in the same amount of time has increased. So what we want to do is we want to uh, determine how, what the performance is, a characterization of that performance as n tends towards infinity. Uh, we don't want, uh, we don't care about small inputs. Right. Uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, all algorithms are going to be fast with small inputs, uh, and we're not going to notice the difference at all. But once we get up to, say, 1 billion elements, right, there is a huge difference between 20 years and 3 seconds. Uh, there's no difference between the first ones that we did with 100, and it was in a blink of an eye, not even measurable, blink of an eye, not even measurable, regardless of whether or not we use an array-based list or a linked list to start this entire discussion. So we're looking at uh, big numbers here. And the tool that we're gonna be using is big O analysis asymptotics. This goes back all the way to the beginning of calculus with Leibniz, uh, and it was adopted for use in algorithm analysis by, um, I, uh, I forget his name now, uh, the guy that wrote LaTeX, uh, but uh, Donald Knuth, uh, uh, Knuth uh, uh, proposed that we use big O analysis to, uh, to uh, analyze algorithms. So I'm not going to give you the original calculus definition. We'll look at the calculus de definition because it gives us a way of proving things. But I'm going to give you the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, algebraic definition is what, I, what I should call it. Right? So let's go ahead and take a look at this mathematical definition. First of all, we got two functions. We want to compare these two functions. These functions are representing the complexity or, of two, or the efficiency of two algorithms. Right? Uh, we say that f of n is big O of g of n if there's a positive constant c and an integer n naught such that f of n is dominated above by c times g of n for all n after n naught. Right? Now don't worry about the, uh, the, the precise definition here. Instead, let's think about the intuition here, the interpretation, the graphical interpretation of this. Uh, for my purposes, let's go ahead and write down two functions here. Right? Uh, f of n is going to be, say, n cubed, and g of n is going to be, uh, let's say, 175n squared plus 50n plus 1. Okay? Now, first of all, uh, what's your intuition? Which one of these functions is the bigger function? Because it grows faster. Right? We, already have, we already have a, an intuition with respect to polynomials. What is it? This one right here. Generally, we're going to work left to right, though. We want to show that f of n is big O of g of n. Right? That's, what, uh, that's the, uh, the interpretation there, or that's the, uh, the, how we write it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch these around. Right? I'm going to make sure that f is the lesser one. Right? And what I want to show is we want to show that f of n is less than or equal to uh, c g of n after some point, all right? In other words, it's not always gonna be the case that uh, f of n is less than g of n. Let's go ahead and look at a, uh, gra a graphical representation of this. I've already done this over here. Uh, there's 175n squared plus 50n plus one, n cubed, right? I'm plotting both of those things. The blue one here is the cubic, or the, is the quadratic uh, polynomial, and the uh, orange one here is the cubic. Now remember, lower is better, because what this is doing, it's, a, it's quantifying time, or memory, or resource, or power, or something like that. So lower resource is better. But you just told me that this one is the better growing function, right? Why is that? Because I only focused on input sizes 1 to 100. Let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit here. Zero to 200. Do you see that crossover point? Right? At some point, then this orange one, the, the cubic one, will dominate the other function. It'll always be on top. It'll always be greater than it. 
If I zoom this out even further to say 1000, right? You can't even see that crossover point anymore because it's somewhere over here. It is pretty obvious now that I have zoomed out all the way here that there is a huge difference between these two functions. If I zoom out even more to like say 1 million, you're not even gonna see that first function. It's essentially gonna be flat because this one is so much faster growing than the other one, okay? So let's go ahead and take it back to 200 here, right? What I wanna show is that eventually this function will always be greater uh, than the other function. That's the intuition there. Uh, that at, at some point they diver, uh, uh, diverge is not the correct, they, they, uh, technical term, but they, they, they diverge and they never meet again, right? There's, this function is always going to be on top of that other function, okay? That's what big O is doing. There is that crossover point, n naught. After at n naught, for all integers greater than n naught, then f of n is less than or equal to some c times g of n, okay? Big O characterizes the relative rate of growth of those two functions, okay? Uh, f of n, we say that f of n, uh, we write, we write that f of n is in big O of g of n. There, there we go. There's the mathematical definition. Are we familiar with this symbol right here? Have we ever had any set theory? No? Okay, that's fine. Because sometimes there will be an abuse of notation, but it's still common enough that it's acceptable. And we'll just say that f of n is big O of g of n. That's not really uh, correct because the thing on the right hand side, big O of g of n, that's a class of functions. It's a set of functions. The thing on the left hand side is a function. So it is a member of that classification of functions. Uh, but usually it's just so common to write equals that we just do it, right? Uh, it's wrong to say that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side because they're not even the same types of things. It would be like saying that this string is equal to this integer over here. It makes no sense, right? But we still use it. We write that f of n is big O of g of n. And we, uh, fr the phrase here is that f of n is big O, big O of g of n, right? G of n. Big O is actually Omicron. But there is no de uh, Omicron, no, I, I did it correctly, right? Uh, I spelled it correctly. The Greek letter Omicron, but there's no difference, typo uh, typography, there's no difference between O and Omicron. So we just write O, okay? I mentioned that because there are other asymptotics. There's big omega, and omega is not uh, any equivalent, right? Uh, omega looks like what? Not many Greek houses here on UNO, right? No? There's omega. Uh, you have little omega there that looks like a W. You do have little o, which is just a small little o. Uh, and then you have theta, big theta, and then little theta. Uh, there is no little theta, but uh, big theta looks like that. And those are other asymptotics that if you watch the videos, the pre-prepared videos, uh, I do talk about those, but it's not necessary for this course, so you can skip it entirely. Right? Uh, basically, f of n is an upper bound, right? f of n's growth rate is bounded above by g of n, right? Uh, that g of n, g of n, is an upper bound on f of n. Remember, we're always looking for the worst case scenario. So this is why we like big O analysis because it provides that upper bound, right? Um, ultimately, this allows us to ignore lower order terms and constants. Because we don't write, uh, uh, we don't, we do not generally, generally write something like f of n is big O of n squared or 3n squared plus n plus 2 or whatever, right? We don't write it like that. We always write big O in sim simplest terms. So I would take away those lower order terms and I instead I would write it as instead we would write that f of n is big O of n squared. I would only take the most significant term without any constants on the left-hand side there, okay? That's the definition. It's not exactly tight. This is not a tight characterization. What I mean by that is the following is true. If I say three of n plus 
three, I, I can say that that's a linear function, right? That makes sense. But it's also true that it's bounded above by a quadratic function. That is also true, right? This one would be tight. This one would be loose, right? A loose characterization. And of course, it's still true that it's bounded above by a cubic, right? This is even looser. Uh, it's just still true that it's bounded above by an exponential, right? It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But what is not true is that n squared is order n, right? That is not bounded above by a linear function. So if I reversed any of those except for the first one, it would be absolutely false. Remember, it's providing an upper bound, okay? So how do we go about showing this? How do we go about showing some proofs here? I'm going to give you three techniques. All right. So given f of n and g of n, how do you prove that one is big O of the other one? Right. So the first step is declare your intuition. Right? Because you got to start somewhere. You have to state, what am I going to prove? So for example, over here, I already did that. I want to show that, here, I'll go ahead and get rid of that. We want to show that f of n is big O of g of n here. I've already switched these around, if you remember, because I already said that, well, this one's clearly the larger function, so I need to show that this one is big O of this one over here. Okay? So that's the first step. Right? Now, there are two algebraic te techniques that I'm going to show you, and then there's a calculus-based technique that I'm going to show you. Uh, approach A is going to be to find, uh, you, you find the last crossover point. Right? That is, you find the largest value, largest integer value, I should say, value. Uh, actually, no, the, let me go ahead and not say integer value yet. Uh, the largest value uh, such that the two functions are equal. Right? Because, again, visually, what that's doing over here is you're finding this crossover point, and then you're saying, okay, well, after that point, it's clear from from uh, this graphic or just plug in uh, one value, right? If I took this one value of 200, you would immediately see that uh, 200 cubed is more than what if you plug 200 in for n over here, right? And that that's the last time that they ever intersect and therefore they're monotone increasing functions. They will always continue uh, to, to diverge like that. Right? All right, so let's do that technique over here. How do I find the crossover point? How do I find that intersection point? If I've got a function a and a function b, how do I find all values of n such that they're equal? Yeah, set them equal to each other. f of n is equal to g of n. In other words, 175 n squared plus 50 n plus 1 is equal to n cubed. Okay. How do I find those n's? Well, first of all, let's collect them onto one, one, one side so that we can, you know, see what it looks like. 175 n squared minus 50 n minus 1 is equal to 0. Hey, that looks kind of familiar. If you set something equal to 0, right, then what are you doing, essentially? You're finding all values n that satisfy this equation. You're finding these things that start with an R. Roots. You find roots. Right. Okay. Now, does anybody know the formulas for finding the roots of a cubic equation? Neither do I. Uh, I know that it, that it involves two different cases, and then those cases involve subcases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, wait a second. At the end of the day, you know, constants don't matter. I can make this even bigger by taking away that one, right? Okay. Later on, if I really want to, I can put that one back in there. And, you know, uh, and then uh, I would only be a plus minus one or something like that on my roots. Right? All right, well, this is still a cubic. But by taking away that scalar value, what have I done? I've figured out one of those roots. Zero, right? Why? Because zero, zero, zero. That means I can factor it out. And I'm left with n squared minus 175 n minus 50 is equal to zero. Now do you know how to do this? All right. Okay. I don't know how to do it on uh, the top of my head, so once again, I'm going to go over to Wolfram Alpha. 
right? Uh, and it's going to be negative b. Remember, b here is negative 175. So 175 plus minus uh, plus minus um, square root of b squared, which is 100, uh, 175 squared, negative 175 squared. You know what? Let's just go ahead and go with n squared minus 175 n minus 50 roots. You tell me what the roots are. Right? There we go. I've got two roots. The first root is negative 0.285. Do you think that that's relevant? Let's come back over here to the plot and let's zoom in um, to two and then negative one. Let's look at it real, really small right here. It is indeed intersecting it over here because one of them is a parabola and, or, well, and one of them's, uh, you know, not a, uh, you know, that weird thing, right? The shoe horse parabola or whatever it is, right? So it is intersecting over here, and by the way, it is intersecting it at zero, right? Well, that's not the exact uh, thing, but yeah, I guess this is a parabola, and then this is, uh, oh no, no, it is. That's the parabola, and then that's the other shoehorn one. And it is uh, intersecting it over here. Is that relevant at all? Remember what we are quantifying here. Remember the function that we're trying to come up with as a resource measure. What, are the, what is the domain of this function? Natural numbers, why? It characterizes what? The input size. Is there such thing as an array of size negative 0.28 elements? That doesn't make any sense. Right? So we're not even going to pay attention to this negative side. We do have to pay attention to the zero because you can't have an input size of zero. But more importantly, is that root right there, 175.285, right? So the other root here is n is equal to 175.285, okay? Now be careful, remember also that these are whole numbers. There is no such thing as an input of 175.285 elements. So let's go up one more. For n naught being 176, the inequality holds, right? In other words, for all n greater than or equal to n naught being 176, or 176, right? Yeah, 176. Then we have that f of n is less than or equal to some c g of n, right? For the f of n and g of n that we originally wrote. What is this C right here? It's a constant, and what, what constant will work here? C can be one, because what I've shown is that F of N is less than or equal to G for all values greater than or equal to 176. I don't need to do anything with this C at all. That's what this te technique is doing. It's basically fixing C to be one and then finding this n naught, this crossover point. If you want to verify, say, I don't know, for n equals 177, right? F of 177 is equal to dot, dot, dot. At G of 177 is equal to pull out your calculators and dot, dot, dot. And you'll verify that F of n is less than or equal to G of n with that C being gone. Right? Again, pull out your cal calculators and do that. Right? I'm not going to. Instead, what I want to show you is an even better technique. These, pro these techniques progressively become easier and easier. Right? So what's approach B? Uh, so uh, approach, approach A is essentially fixing C to be one and finding N naught right? and sh demonstrating that the inequality holds. What about approach B here? Well, we've got two unknowns. By the way, there are an infinite number of pairs, C and N naught, that will work, right? Uh, all you need to do is fix one and find the other. Well, if approach A is fixing C to be one and finding N naught, then approach B is going to be fixing N naught to be zero or something small 
and finding C, AC constant that works, right? That demonstrates the inequality, okay? So let's come over here. And basically what you wanna do for approach B is that you wanna show an inequality of the following. 175 n squared plus 50 n plus one is less than or equal to some C, which I need to find, n cubed, right? I need to make this inequality right here. I need to prove it though, right? I can't just say, can't just start there and say, uh, 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 you know, uh, this inequality holds, right? I need, that's where I want to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that down and put that down at the bottom, right? I need to make this left-hand side look like the right-hand side and remember that it's an inequality. I can make it bigger. I can make it as big as I want. So how could I make this bigger? Well, I need to make it look something like this. In other words, I've got three terms. I need those three terms to collapse down into one term, and I need that term to be n cubed with the sum c sitting out front. So how could I take care of this other term right here? I need to make it bigger because of the inequality. Well, I could make it two. I could make it three. I could make it 50. But that's not going to help me collapse that term back onto this other term over here. What could I do though? I could make it n, right? Now, what does that hold for? For, uh, because, because, uh, actually no, that will hold for all n greater than or equal to what? One, good. So I can't start at zero, uh, but I can start at one, right? Okay, well, guess what? That allows me to collapse that term down into 51n. Right? Now I've got down to two terms. Keep going, right? How could I make that second term big enough, bigger, so that it collapses down under this first term? Plus 51n squared. For what n? For all n greater than or equal to one, right? Just the same as before, okay? That's equal now to 226 n squared. We're almost there. I've got a c sitting out front here, but I have an n squared here instead of an n cubed, okay? Well, what's to stop me from doing this? 226 n cubed. Is that always true? Is a square always greater than a cube? Careful. What about negative values? Negative one, is that true? Negative one squared is one, but negative one cubed is negative one, right? That inequality does not hold for negative numbers, but guess what? Do I have negative numbers? Nope. Because of my original assumption here. For all n greater than or equal to one. So therefore, for C being 226 and N naught being one, the inequality holds. That's my proof. This series of derivations here. Just make it bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to what you want. Just don't make it too big and you know, over jump whatever you're trying to show. I always like to write the left-hand side up here, the right-hand side down here, and then work towards that right-hand side, okay? Again, 226 and one, there are an infinite number of values. 227 and one would have worked. 228 and one would have worked, right? I could come up with an infinite number of these. I just need to come up with two of them, okay? So the characterization of approach B is just simply set up the inequality, set up, the inequality and make the make f of n bigger and bigger until it looks like g like g, g of n right. that's much easier right. here's another technique calc technique so what you do is you set up a limit Here's the, uh, not, here's the original definition of, F, uh, of uh, 
uh, big O. I've got F and G. I take their ratio. Right? Now, if the limit converges to zero, then we know that F of N is big O of G of N. Why is that? If it converges to zero, what's happening to the denominator down here? It's growing faster and faster and faster. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the entire thing is collapsing down to zero. Therefore, the rate of growth of G is greater than the rate of growth of F, and we can conclude that F of N is big O of G of N. What if it diverges off to infinity? That means the numerator is growing much, much faster than the denominator. It's getting bigger without bounds, and so we can, can conclude the exact opposite. The G of N is big O of F of N. What if it converges to a constant? That means that the rate of growth of the numerator and the denominator are basically canceling each other out, and it's converging down to one or two or something like that. They have the same rate of growth, and that's the big theta definition. Don't worry about the big theta definition. It just simply means it means that both f of n is big O of g of n, and let me emphasize that, and g of n is equal uh, big O of f of n. Right? It works both ways basically. Right? They have an asymptotic equivalence. Uh, linear functions are always going to be equivalent to linear functions. Uh, quadratic functions are always going to be equivalent to quadratic functions. All right, so put on your calc hats for a moment and let's go ahead and set up the limit as n tends towards infinity of 175 n squared plus 50 n plus one all over n cubed. All right, now clearly the limit is gonna be zero because we've already pr proven this twice now that f of n is big O of g of n. But how do we go about showing that using calc techniques? How do I show that this limit is zero? I've got a monotone increasing function on bottom, the top and bottom, so I can't just say it, it is. Yeah. All right, well, you could, but that's, that, that's, that's skipping a few steps, right? You, 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 so this is, <laughs> this is not a calc course and I'm not gonna require like a delta epsilon proof or something like that. Uh, or did you do delta epsilon proofs? Oh no, okay. Uh, anyway, you do know something about limits though, right? You know that the limit of sums is equal to the sum of limits and you know algebra. So let's go ahead and break this up into three summations. 175 n squared over n cubed plus the limit as n tends towards infinity of 50 n over n cubed plus the limit as n tends towards infinity of one over n cubed. Now, that, that, that right there is obvious. Again, I'm not going to, uh, the, I, I call that obvious land, right? You don't need a proof for that, right? Because you have a monotone increasing function on the bottom constant function on the top, it's clearly going to limit to zero. You still need to do your algebra though. That n will cancel with that leaving two. Same situation, you have a monotone increasing function on the bottom, constant function on top, and therefore the limit is zero. What about the first one? That cancels with that and you are left with the same limit, zero. Right? And zero. By the way, the only way that you can actually break this up into a sum of limits is if they converge. And so I was putting the cart before the horse because I was saying, oh, they do converge. Okay, well then what I did up here was valid, right? So chicken and the egg, it's still a bad argument. But this ain't a clout class, so I'm not going to require clout proofs, right? Okay, let's use that idea for a couple of other things. What if I said log of n versus n? Okay. First of all, what's your intuition? Which one of these is bigger in terms of rate of growth? N, right? And by the way, remember, all our logs are base two implicitly, okay? So here's, here's approach A, right? I wanna show that log of N is less than or equal to N, right? Some C sub N. For what N does that, is that true? Is it for all n not greater than or, or for uh, all for all here? Let me for all n greater than or equal to n not being zero. Careful. If I plug zero in over here, what do I get in the right hand side? Zero. 
If I plug in zero right here, what do I get? Undefined, right? That's not allowed. All right, we'll try it for one. All right. Log of one is what? Zero in any base. Uh, C being one and N being one over here. Yeah, it works. What about two? Two and two, log base two, it's always gonna work after that. In other words, do not assume zero, right? Because it's not always defined. That's how I would do it with one of those two other techniques, but let's use calc because calc is much easier. If I set up a limit here as N tends towards infinity of log base two implicit all over N, okay? I have a monotone increasing function on the top. Even though it's very slow growing, it's still monotone increasing. I've got a monotone increasing function on the bottom. I can't get rid of them unless I use some sort of calc technique here. What can I do now? Oh, we do, don't they cover this in calc? This is equal to the limit as n tends towards infinity of the first derivative on top and the first derivative on the bottom. Well, yeah, there we go. What's that called? Oh, hope eat all. Right, whatever rule or law or whatever, right? Do you remember it now? Okay. So tell me what the uh, derivative on the bottom is. One, and it goes away. Tell me what the derivative of the top is. One over n with a constant out front. One over natural log of two times one over n. Well, take that back outside. It really doesn't matter. It's just some C. And you have a monotone increasing function on the bottom, constant function on the top. And so you can conclude that this is zero. And therefore, log of n is big O of n. Right? Because you used proper calc techniques. Okay? If I asked you about f of n being 2 to the n, an exponential function, and g of n being three to the n, another exponential function. What's the relationship between these two? Well, you might say, well, okay, clearly this one's gonna be bigger, but let's set up our limit and find out. We have to actually prove this. Limit as n tends towards infinity of two to the n over three to the n. Now, if you jump immediately to the Hopital's law, what's that gonna end up being? Limit as n tends towards infinity of the first derivative of the top is gonna to be what? Natural log of two times two to the n. Did it go away? Nope. nope. All right, so we didn't get anywhere. Nope. Yeah. Uh, okay, what, what convergence test do you wanna use here? Okay, you're, you're close. Let, let, let's just get into an algebra first, All right? Let's, and then, then we'll use that convergence test. So if, I, if I've got n here on top and n on top, I've got a common exponent, right? Remember, that's just n right there. So this is 2 thirds to the n. n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 2 thirds times 2 thirds is 4 ninths, right? times two thirds is eight twenty sevenths, uh, 16 eighty firsts. What's happening to that? Getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because this thing right here, a to the n for a being less than one is gonna have a convergence of zero and we're done. Two to the n is big O of three to the n. What other convergence tests would, 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 would be of this form? What if a to the n for a being equal to one? What does that go off to? Oh, a to the a, to, uh, so a is just one. So one times one times one times one. It just stays at one. Now for a being strictly greater than one, what happens? That goes off to infinity, regardless of how small it is, right? one plus epsilon for any epsilon raised to the n of the limit of that n tends towards infinity is going to diverge. Right? 
This is why compound interest is a great thing. Even if you had 1.00000, a million zeros here, one, you just still have to wait a sufficient amount of time and you'll have as much money as you want, right? Because it compounds. Right? Of course, that small and you're gonna be waiting several thousand, 10,000, 100,000 years to do it, but it'll still work right? if you go to sleep or something. All right, so that's the other technique, okay? Uh, we've already seen quick sort, and, or sorry, we've already seen selection sort and insertion sort. We've all also seen uh, categories of functions. Uh, for example, constants are simply uh, uh, order one. We don't write order 42 or order negative one or order zero or something like that. We just simplify it to one. We also don't say order zero because there's nothing that, that's free, right? If you're running something, that's costing you time. Uh, the only time that your computer doesn't cost you is when you shut it off, right? Theoretically, it's still costing you something because of batteries draining or whatever, right? Uh, you've got logarithmic behavior. Binary search is a prime example of that. You've got linear. Linear search is one of those. You've got quasi-linear, which are going to be efficient sorting algorithms that we're going to look at here today in a moment, right? Uh, you've got quadratic sorting algorithms like selection sort and insertion sort, cubic, more generally, polynomial, any n to the k for a fixed k, right? Uh, it could be n to the 20th, right? But as we've already seen, is quadratic even reasonable in today's day and age? Was 20 years reasonable? Nope. So even for, uh, even for something that's quadratic, cubic, polynomial, exponential, super exponential, no way. Right? Don't even bother looking at those. Because if it's super exponential, say like a 52 card deck, the number of ways that you can shuffle that is more than the number of atoms in the universe. You would not be able to even physically build the computer to hold all that memory. Right? So there's no way that you're going to ever be able to compute that within your lifetime. Right? It's not tractable at all. But again, even quadratic at 20 years is not acceptable either. Basically, quasi-linear and down to constant are the only things that you should shoot for. The only time that you should care about quadratic and above is when you're doing theoretical computer science. Because then the theor theoreticians say, oh, wow, I, I can do primality testing in n to the 12th, and that's a huge breakthrough. Yay. Right? That's still not going to be something that you use in practice. Right? And that is a real example from 2001, the AKS algorithm. Yeah? Okay, yeah, go ahead. 115 years, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, pro the problem is you're, everything gets eaten by inflation, so it doesn't really matter. You, ha you have to find something that, uh, that outstrips inflation. That's usually market. Invest it in the stock market. Yes, it'll go down and crash every 20, 30 years or something like that, but it'll always come back, right? Unless, the, of course, the entire United States collapses. Yeah, <laughs> and then th that's why you invest in the world economy, because <laughs> some countries might collapse, but not all of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, at that point, if that happens, you invest in, in, in guns and ammo. <laughs> all right, so. We're gonna switch our uh, gears here and uh, start uh, looking at analysis of recursive algorithms. I assume that you did recover recursion in computer science one. Recursion is just where a function calls itself, all right? So our first example here is going to be quicksort, all right? Uh, did you see quicksort already? Uh, maybe in your first class or something like that? No, no, that's okay, all right? So here it is. I'm going to go ahead and give you an example. Uh, let's go ahead. I, I really like my pre-prepared array here, so um, I'm going to use it. There we go. All right. I crafted this array for a very specific reason because I wanted to demonstrate all the sorting algorithms, and I wanted to demonstrate uh, the best case running times and the worst case running times. Uh, so the way that quick sort works here is that step one, you choose a pivot element. And for this one, I'm just going to choose the first one. There are lots of different ways that you could do it. 
Uh, the best way that you could do it is to find the median. The median is the one where it's all sorted and it's right in the middle. Well, guess what? That means it has to be sorted first. So you're not going to be able to choose the median. There is a median finding algorithm that uh, runs in linear time, but it, 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 in practice, it's nothing that you want to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the first one as my pivot element here, 42. Okay. And why do I call it a pivot element? Because what we're going to do is we're going to pivot things around it. Anything that is less than it is going to go to the left. Anything that is greater than it is going to go to the right. The way that I'm going to do that is by keeping track of two index variables here. I and J. All right. And I'm going to move I to the left and J to the, or sorry, I to the right and J to the left until I find two things that are on the wrong side, right? Everything over here is supposed to be less than 42. Everything over here eventually is going to be greater than 42. And then where do we put 42? Right in the middle, right? So I'm looking at, there we go. I'm looking at four right now. Four is less than 42, so it stays on that side. Nine is less than 42, so it stays on that side. Four less, oh, 101, it's on the wrong side, okay? Stop. Now I need to find something that is on the wrong side or the other side, something that is less than 42, and I immediately find it right here, zero. 102 and zero need to be exchanged here, and so I end up swapping them. This is called partitioning. I put everything that is less than 42 over here, everything that is greater than 42 over here. And so when I'm done with this, uh, I don't know, uh, let's go ahead and, can I erase them? Yeah, there we go. 102 and zero. And after I'm done swapping them, zero and 102. There we go, zero. Now continue that process. I will now proceed over here. 34 is less than 42. So I proceed, uh, less than 42, less than 42, and guess what? I and J now coincide. So the process is done. What I need to do now is I need to come back one step, see that two is on the wrong side, and I'm going to, uh, to swap 42 and two. Uh, let me go ahead and 42, uh, make it thick. 42 and two, so that, Two is over here and 42 is now over here. Remember that that was my pivot element. Tell me about that element right there. Should I ever move it again? Everything over here is what? Less than 42. Everything over here is greater than 42. Should I ever move 42 again? Nope. So I choose a pivot element and partition around the pivot, the pivot, right? Why do we call it the pivot element? Because, well, you know, uh, what, what is that? Irrigation, pivot, pivot irrigation. It goes around in a circle based on the home place, the, the pivot where the water actually feeds into it. Or basketball, you take two steps, that becomes your pivot foot. You can't pick it up, right? But you can pivot around it, right? So. That's why we call it the pivot element. We put everything over here and everything over here, okay? Now what we do is we recurse on the left partition and the right partition. This is the left. This is the right, all right? I repeat until dot, dot, dot. When do I stop? For example, over here, the right partition. It's just one element. Do I need to do anything with it? Nope. So when the size, until the size is less than or equal to one. If there are two elements, of course, I need to see if they're in order or out of order and need to be swapped but I'm going to go ahead and repeat until the size is down there. Two, four, nine, four. 
two, four, oh, here, two, four, nine, four. What were the rest of them? Zero, thirty-four, twelve. Zero, thirty-four, and twelve. Let's do one more example here, one more iteration of the left partition. There's my pivot element. Here's my I, and here's my J. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to keep going until I find something that's on the wrong side. Well, guess what? Four is on the wrong side because it is greater than two. 12 is on the correct side, the right side. 34 is greater than two, zero, is less than two. So I would end up swapping these two things. Okay? And I'm left with zero and four. Right. Continue this process. Nine is on the wrong side because it's greater than four. Stop. Four is on the wrong side, uh, on the correct side because it is uh, greater than two. Nine is on the, now, uh, now these both coincide. So what would I end up doing? I would say, oh, this one, uh, this one is 